the first webinar in our three-part series called Civil Procedure Made Practical. I am Samantha Reddy, and I'm one of the content development managers at LexisNexis. I'm responsible for maintaining and developing our legal content in the areas of civil procedure, legal practice, family law, and criminal law. Um, in addition to developing content, my focus is on enhancing your experience. We're trying to better understand your needs and challenges so that we can help you become better practitioners, judicial officers, and prosecutors. I'm passionate about building and maintaining strong, effective relationships with our authors and our customers. We are very well aware of these very trying times and we are doing all we can to help our customers. This webinar is just one way of us giving back to the market. Okay, I think we're just gonna jump right in. I'm gonna go through a few rules. Um, this webinar series is aimed at providing you with guidelines on the steps of litigation and mapping out what to do in order to resolve a dispute quickly and cost-effectively. The content will help you get to grips with current legal thought trends and learn how to stay relevant to your clients. These sessions are powered by Lexis Library and Lexis Practical Guidance. The legislation and case law that we discuss here today can be found on these online platforms. If you would like more information on the content we offer on either of these platforms, you will have the opportunity to share your, share your details a little later on in the session, and we will get one of our agents to contact you. Just a few housekeeping rules before we jump in. All de delegates are muted. You will have an opportunity to, to submit questions via a Q&A tab. Um, please reserve the chat box for general comments only. The webinar recording will be made available to all delegates a few days after this session. Um, slides will not be supplied separately, but the slide content will be fully visible in the webinar recording. So on to business. We are very, very pleased and honored to have with us today Advocate Ismail Hussain. Um, Advocate Hussain is the author of the LexisNexis Practical Drafting Skills title. He is co-author of A Guide to Discovery in South Africa, as well as a regular contributor to the civil procedure practice area on Lexis practical guidance. He is a former judge of the High Court and the Competition Appeal Court. He has served on various legal training panels and is currently on the panel of trainers for the Law Society and Legal Aid SA. He provides training in legal and commercial drafting, trial technique, and financial compliance courses. He also runs a very busy practice and is a professor of law at Nelson Mandela University. So today, he will be helping us to deconstruct how to best apply logic to legal problems and better understand things from a client's perspective. Today's session will look at commencing litigation and motion procedure. Advocate Hussein, sorry for the delay. Welcome and over to you. All right. Okay. Can you hear me, Samantha? I can. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, sorry for the glitches but you are lawyers and imagine you were linked to the Department of Justice. So it, you, will, you, you'll be, you should be used to glitches then. All right, now the topic is about civil procedure. Now, um, Samantha mentioned uh, starting litigation. Now, this is a three part series. In this particular part, I want to deal with what I consider to be absolutely crucial to practitioners. It's about the whole approach to litigation. Um, we in South Africa are a little bit behind uh, the, the best practices in the world. We are behind England, Canada, Australia. Um, uh, they've, they've changed the way they approach litigation. And it started as far back as 1999 um, uh, with, with, the, with the Wolf Commission in England. And they have made uh, uh, great strides in litigation. Um, but what I want to concentrate on in this particular session um, is to help you as practitioners um, to change your mindset and to change your approach so that you become more relevant to your clients. And that's the important thing. 
It's about serving your client. So let me start immediately. What you're going to get in this session is what is expected of you as a lawyer and how do you approach litigation? When a client comes to you and says, issue a summons or bring an application, or I want to bring an urgent interdict, how do you approach it? Now, the actual mechanics of bringing motions and actions, I will deal with that in the next two uh, webinars. But today is probably the most important session uh, we're going to have. But before I get on to the more serious stuff, let's have a little bit of fun, okay? I want you to take a look at this. And you'll be very familiar with it. Uh, um, these are excerpts I took out of correspondence that you reg see regularly between attorneys. Um, we will obtain a punitive cost order against you. We will deal with this in the appropriate forum. Our rights are reserved in total. People still say in total. I don't know why. Uh, this is entirely without prejudice. Those are the most useless words ever written in legal history. Without derogating from the generality of the foregoing, it's as if you get to swap that line off when you do articles. And my favorite, any action will be vigorously opposed. Why is it that we can't merely oppose an action? We have to be vigorous about it, okay? So there are various degrees of opposition, vigorous ones and non-vigorous ones. Somebody has to explain that to me. You will be ipso facto barred. This is an abuse of the processes of the court. And of course, my absolute favorite, we trust the above is in order. Now, you've seen this in, in letters. I've seen letters of demand where an attorney writes to someone to say, we will issue summons against you. We will take a judgment. We will execute against your property. We will evict you from your premises. And then they end the letter with, we trust the above is in order. I mean, it's brilliant, right? Someone reading that, you threaten them with the most dire of consequences. And then you say, well, we trust the above is in order. Now, someone needs to explain that to me. Now, the, the, you, you can relate to all these things that you see on the screen because you write this every day. Now, what I am saying is this is a symptom of what's wrong with the way we practice. Now, let's move on to the, to the important stuff. Since university, we've learned about this thing called justice and access to justice. You'll see it in our constitution. What we see, what we talk about as access to justice, um, it's the notion of having access to courts, having access to lawyers, legal representatives, and um, um, being offered a fair hearing. But I want to take you to a very different angle, which is far more relative now, um, relevant now. And it's what Richard Susskind said. What is access to justice? It's not about access to courts and lawyers and so on. It is about how we resolve disputes. Now, let me just explain that. So someone comes to you in your office and says, issue a summons. So they have access to justice. They've got access to a lawyer. They've got access to the courts. They will get a, they will get a fair hearing. But now the matter takes three to six years to finish. Where's the justice in that? That's not justice. When it becomes justice is when the, when the dispute is resolved quickly and cheaply. That's what clients want. They don't want to wait three to six years and spend an enormous amount of money that is not access to justice. So how do you become more relevant? Your job is to resolve the dispute quickly and then at affordable price. That's what you have to do. 
it is, the, the case is not about you and your opponent. It is not about taking points or showing your opponent a point. It's all about resolving the dispute quickly. Uh, now, one of the things I get asked a lot is, well, how do we make money then if, if we don't run the matter? Well, the matter is, uh, the answer to that is quite simple. Uh, we have studies in, in the UK and in Canada and the USA and in Australia have shown that those practitioners who concentrate their minds on the substance of the dispute, then take steps to resolve it as soon as possible and as cheaply as possible, those practitioners have happy clients and they get a good reputation and they make more money. There's no doubt about that. And by the way, those of you who are experienced practitioners will know that keeping a file alive for six years does not make you money. It costs you money to keep that file. You have to house the file, you need staff to administer it and so on. You just, you just run at a loss. So the way we traditionally conducted cases is changing. Um, but change can only be meaningful to your client if the lawyers change, the lawyers need to change. If you don't change, the court processes are going to leave you behind and it's going to become a nightmare. Already I see practitioners struggling with how the courts are dealing with cases now. The, I will take you through some case management and quite frankly, uh, the uh, practitioners struggle with it. It's not because they're incompetent. It's because they they, they're not getting their minds around what this means and how to adapt and, and to be more flexible. Um, you've all heard of judicial case management by now, or what I prefer to call active judicial case management. Um, one of the problems we have as you all know, is the long delays and unaffordable costs of litigation. Now, our courts, uh, well, throughout the world, both in the adversarial courts as well as the inquisitorial courts, the judiciary is taking um, an active um, part in this to reduce the time reduce complexity and reduce cost. How do we do this? Case managers focuses on the legal practitioners. The case itself does not require managing. It's about the lawyers. Case management, judicial case management is about managing the lawyers, not the case itself. Now, what can you expect from the judiciary? And I can tell you this has already happened in many jurisdictions around the world and it's happening here. The judiciary must manage lawyers to be more cooperative and less adversarial, okay? So all this business about vigorous defenses and, and points taking and so on, it's got to stop. And judges can play an important role in that. Um, I can tell you, I practiced in Johannesburg for 40 years and Johannesburg lawyers, and I've seen this in Durban and Cape Town as well. We are seriously adversarial people. You know, when we start a case, we, all we're concentrating on is to dawn of the other side. Let's get a cost order, okay? And that's, it, that's, that's what it's all about, getting cost orders, punitive orders. The last thing we did was to concentrate on the actual dispute, the substance of the dispute and try and solve it. Okay, we didn't do that. Lawyers, judges should not allow lawyers to take points involving process and procedure. Now we are champions of that. We take points involving process and procedure over and again, we file special pleas, 
we 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 start uh, uh, we induce amendments we we have interlocutory applications none of those things have anything to do with the substance of the dispute the judges must concentrate the lawyers on the dispute let's forget about the fact that the discovery affidavit was one week late or the the uh, the Commissioner of Oaths didn't sign the affidavit correctly. I mean, these are the, the so-called brilliant points you can take. It's rubbish. You have to stop it. Then we've got this thing called the non-meritorious action or defense. What is that? This, these are people who litigate because they can. Or these are people who litigate only to, to, uh, to, get, to gain time to waste time. These are people who come to you and say, Mr. Attorney or Advocate, please defend this matter for me. Okay, so what's the de defense? Now, I haven't got one. I just need some time. That wastes court resources. It is not to be in our courts. We don't want people like that in this court system. And our judges are going to take a, a tough stance on it. Um, there's, a, there's an article written by Judge um, Rogers from the Western Cape. It's about the non-meritorious defense. Um, it's, a, it's, it's an article about ethics. I would like you to read it. Judges are now going to punish practitioners who do not cooperate, who are overly adversarial, and do not take reasonable steps to resolve the matter. Now, you can go and read Rule 379A. It's at the bottom of this. Um, you, it's, it's in the guide notes um, in the Lexus product, but there's 37, you're, you've all got access to the uniform rules. Go and read 379A. We've had it for a long time, but nobody, the judges did not enforce it. Well, I got news for you, now they are. Attorneys and advocates are being punished with cost orders for not taking reasonable steps to resolve the dispute. Now, postponements must be, must be routinely refused by judges. What we are doing now in our courts, all the high courts, is that we do not want to place matters on the trial roll that cannot proceed. In other words, we place matters on the trial roll and it gets postponed or it gets struck off the roll or it gets settled. We don't want that. Um, judges are to ensure that the parties are actually ready to proceed to trial before allowing the matter on the roll. That is happening now in the, in the shape of case management. We want to prevent postponements and we want to encourage early settlements. You are all familiar now with the um, new Rule 41A. This is going to make some changes. What we are doing now is forcing the practitioners to do what they should ordinarily be doing. But instead, we take on a extremely uh, adversarial um, uh, attitude to this. Procedures are highly, but unnecessarily technical and incomprehensible to anyone but expert lawyers. In fact, not even all the lawyers understand the complexities we can start. So that the parties, your client, has to surrender their case to the lawyers. They end up not, not knowing what's going on. All they know is that they have to keep paying and the matter never gets resolved. I mean, it really gives us a bad name. So we have to stop it. What are the problems? There's no actual compliance with the rules. You know, I, I get told all the time that there are delays in court because of the system and because of the rules. And who blames that? Blames the rules and the system? The lawyers blame them. But it's not the rules. It's not the system. There's nothing wrong with the system in court. 
It's the way the lawyers practice. Time frames are ignored. All the uniform rules have a time frame. Hardly anyone complies. They just ignore it. Pleadings have become technical documents. Now, you can try this yourself. Go to any high court or even the magistrate's court, take out 10 civil cases, 10 files, read the pleadings, and then ask yourself the question, what is the issue? I promise you, if you find one file where the, plea, where the pleadings actually tell you what the issues are, you'll be lucky. It is just technical to the point where a judge reads the pleadings and is left wondering what the issues are between the parties. We're stopping that. Discovery, oh heavens, you must see the, ab the abuse with discovery. You routinely go to court and you discover four lever arch files of documents, run a two day trial and use three pages from them. Now who pays for all this nonsense? The client. And that in itself causes delays. I've, I've sat in interlocutory matters, opposed applications involving discovery, completely unnecessary. This is going to be controlled. We now want narrow discovery. You only discover what you need to deal with the particular issue, the triable issue, and nothing else. This business of discovering the whole office file has got to stop. Interlocutory disputes. This is one of the greatest causes of long delays and expensive litigation. You're all familiar with these things, applications to compel discovery, applications uh, for further and better discovery, for further and better um, particulars, um, sp oppose special pleas, uh, disputes over amendments, all of that stuff. Now, one of the things that has happened with case management is that all of these issues are dealt with between the attorneys. I mean, for God's sake, if your opponent doesn't discover a document, why on earth do you have to bring an application? Can't you call that opponent or write him a letter to say, listen, you've got this document, your client has this document, can we please have a copy? Oh no, you'll, you'll draft a notice of motion, founding affidavit, service, draft orders, appearance in court, all for what? For, because the lawyers are not cooperating. That's why that's got to stop. Instead of being focused on the substance of the dispute, the lawyers bring interlocutories, uh, which have nothing to do with the dispute. These are just self-created procedural disputes. And the worst thing is client has no control over it. The client has to keep paying but they have no control over it. So there's an unnecessary emphasis on process, procedure, compliance, with very little attention to the merits of the case. And, and I'll give you a good example. Come on, be honest. How many of us actually knew the facts of the case, worked out what the issues are, drafted the, the particulars of claim according to the facts of your case before issuing summons, interviewed the witnesses, reviewed the documents before issuing summons. We don't do, we never did that. We did all of those things two weeks before the trial. And guess what happens? Inevitably, we, we find that we got the pleadings wrong, uh, or we need to amend, or that a witness has disappeared, so then there's going to be a postponement. Okay. Um, case managers are getting rid of it. Now, this thing, settlement, the possibility of settlement is ignored. When client walks into your office and says, Mr. X owes me a certain amount of money. 
You go right, we'll bang out a summons, we'll take him to the cleaners, don't worry, that's what you tell your client. It's never occurred to us to say to client, listen, can I call the, this person or his attorney and see if we can't settle it over a, a meeting? Over a cup of coffee, can't we talk about it and see if we can't make it go away? But you see, the attorneys are thinking, the lawyers are thinking, well, if I did that, I won't be able to run a matter and charge fees. Well, you know what? You're wrong. You're, you will have a happy client, will recommend you every time, and will keep coming back to you. You will be a far more successful lawyer. We had rule 37 for decades. If you go back to, the, to our practice directives, you will see that settlement is one of the agenda items in a rule 37 pre-trial conference. Now I've attended hundreds of those things. What do we do? We look at each other and say, um, we, we, we just minute it, we say, um, no possibility of a settlement. Well, we now have Rule 41A that compels the lawyers to consider settlement. Um, then there's this horrible thing called door settlements. There are a number of reported decisions which you should look at where the attorneys and the advocates and the experts were punished because they entered into a door settlement when they were well aware of the fact that this matter could have been settled months ago. Right here in Johannesburg, if you had a door settlement on the morning of the trial, you'll have to explain to the judge why there's a door settlement and why the matter could not have been settled five weeks ago. So you are now compelled to deal with the matter of settlement very early, as early as possible. Rule 41A will compel you to do that. Case managers will compel you to do that. But if you, if you can't settle the whole matter, you should at least try and settle as many of the issues as possible. That is something a, a, a case manager will require you to do. That's what Rule 41A requires you to do. So, and let's face it, people, those of you who are experienced practitioners, whenever you went to court and settled the matter at the door, tell me something and be honest with yourself. In how many cases were you unaware that the matter was going to be settled at the door? The lawyers always know it's going to be settled. They knew it months ago, but now they run the thing, charge preparation fee, preparation fee trial fee, and so on, uh, to settle it at the door, at, at, at the court. Well, the judges have seen through that. It's not allowed anymore, okay? If you did that and you can't explain, you will then have to pay, you will be, the costs will be disallowed, okay? Now, inadequately controlled legal costs. Litigation is seriously unaffordable. Um, your client comes to you with a claim and says, look, I'm owed 30,000 rand. What are you gonna tell your client? <laughs> it's not worth issuing summons. That's not what you should do. You should say, well, let's see if we can't settle this thing. Okay, let's call the other side um, instead of issuing the summons. Right. So, Legal costs are very often disproportionate to the actual case or the, 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 the relief or the amounts involving in each case. Um, what that means is those who can afford it will, will litigate extravagantly, um, appoint senior counsel, document bomb the other side, um, drown them in paper, and so on. Well, what you're doing is just an abuse of court. And, we, and it was done 
because the system allowed you to do it. Not anymore. I can assure you in, in many jurisdictions around the world, when litigation starts, the lawyers have to get together with the case manager or in a case conference very early in the process and agree a budget. You have to agree a budget. I'll give you an example. In order to curtail the costs of discovery, in England, the, 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 the practitioners are compelled to get together and agree a budget. How much can we spend on discovery? So that litigation doesn't become disproportionate in terms of cost. The whole idea is to, is to level the playing field. We know in this country we are we are an inequality is is rife. There are people who simply can who have who have their rights trampled on, but simply cannot um, take the matter to court because of the costs. Well, we need to stop that. We also have this unfettered right to appeal. I mean, this can go on and on. Um, the matter never gets resolved. Years go by, thousands of rands are spent. So what are we doing about it? We want to focus the attorneys squarely on addressing the substance of the dispute with the object of resolving it quickly, cheaply, moving them from technical points taking to becoming less adversarial. Uh, now, I've put a warning down there. If you can't adapt to this, dispute resolution is not for you. Go and do conveyancing or something, wills and estates. Stay out of dispute resolution. Um, we now have, or we will have, it started already in the form of case management, the judicial oversight over the way litigation is conducted. It's no longer going to take too long. Um, I mean, the, the, the judge president here in Johannesburg, for example, the deputy judge president, at roll call, he look at the matter and say, wait a minute, this is a 2012 case. Why did it take so long to come to court? The practitioners are asked to explain, and there can be consequences. Um, one, of the, one of the real problems is that the lawyers collude with each other. They ring each other up and say, listen, can, can I have a postponement? Uh, well, we'll reserve the cost. Yeah, fine, do it. The, the judiciary nor the clients have anything to do with this. They just run the matter. Well, I'm telling you now, it's going to stop. Uh, Pre-trial discovery, uh, documents, um, opinions, all of those things for decades, it's been in the uniform rules. The idea is to be more transparent, to, to disclose to your, to your opponent what the case is about. The whole idea behind that is to resolve the matter and only take to court that one issue or two issues that require a judge to deal with it, to resolve it. So the, to give you an example, in England right now, they decided pleadings are too technical. We don't know what this means anymore. So they scrapped it. They don't have particulars of claim. They don't have a plea. And this happened in a number of countries. What they have, the parties must file a statement of claim and a statement of defense. The idea is to get them to disclose what the facts of the dispute are. Now, the, when the lawyers get hold of this, they want to play their cards close to the chest, you see. We want to be great poker players. Just don't give too much away. That's not how you resolve disputes. The system will do everything possible to place the parties at the center of their own disputes. We want to demystify litigation. 
um, deprofessionalize it. Um, you have a right to exercise informed consent over the continuing participation in the justice system. Clients have that right. The lawyers have to facilitate it. Now, I'm going to go into an important part of this, this um, webinar where I'm going to take you through what is expected of the lawyers. Um, and these are principles that came out of the Wolf Commission in England, and they have been adopted worldwide. Litigation will be avoided where possible. Now, what that means is clients must be encouraged to must be encouraged to start court proceedings to resolve disputes only as a last resort. Let's try some non-adversarial methods first. Let's try negotiation, mediation, uh, uh, arbitration, settlement. Uh, if you go and look at Rule 41A, that is exactly the object of Rule 41A. Now, this is done in the best interests of client. Now, obviously, it seems like the lawyers are not going to make money now because the matter got settled. That's not the way you approach it. You approach it because you want to, to resolve the dispute and you want to do so as soon as possible. That's what clients want. Can you imagine our clients? They have to live with this problem for, for up to six years. Uh, I mean, it's really debilitating if you think about it. Um, and also, this kind of attitude causes less damage to the relationship between the parties. People who litigate are people who know each other, always. Strangers don't end up litigating. It's somebody you know, and it destroys the relationship. Attorneys' practices and advocates uh, uh, who are non-referral must have access to information about ADR. In other words, your practice must be ready and geared to use ADR, not issue summons as first choice. Now, we have disclosure protocols for uh, in in a number of cases that that uh, that uh, that are that actually burden the court role, and I'm talking of RAF cases, medical negligence cases. Um, we now require better disclosure by the parties, and we require parties to try and settle the matter before, before coming to court. Now, before starting court actions, parties must be encouraged to make offers to settle the whole or part of a dispute. Now, what that means is, when you get an offer from, an, from, from someone, don't laugh at them and say, we will see you in the appropriate forum. You know, write a letter like that, being vigorous again. Uh, don't do that. Listen to the offer. If it is a frivolous offer, decline it politely, okay? Um, when you get an offer that is reasonable, never laugh at it because you'll pay a price later. If you decide to litigate the thing and you run it for two or three years, the costs will far exceed any advantage you got. It is worth not noting that if it is found that an attorney stood in the way of settlement, and by the way, that's not uncommon, then the attorney may be ordered to pay the wasted costs. There are reported cases. I'll give you a reference in a moment. Lawyers have to be less adversarial. They need to be more cooperative. There will be an expectation of openness and cooperation between the parties from the outset. Courts will express disapproval for lack of cooperation. Courts will impose punitive cost orders. This is already being done here, especially in Gauteng. And the judges are applying Rule 379A of the Uniform Rules. I, I, I'd like you to go and read that rule and digest what it actually means, okay? Um, 
Our courts encourage the use of ADR, that pretrial conferences and case management conferences. Now, we've always had Rule 37 um, and pretrial conferences. Those things were just part of the process. We never really took them seriously. Well, now you have to. And if there's a settlement, um, the, the, and it took a long time, one of the questions judges will ask is that why did it take such a long time? What was the cause? Who, who or what stood in the way? You'll, you'll need an, a rational explanation for that. Otherwise, you'll pick up a punitive cost order. Now, litigation has to be less complex. Now, let's be, let's face it, who makes it complex? We do, okay? The courts are no longer going to tolerate clever technical points taking. You must focus on the substance of the dispute. If there is a technical fault with your opponent's papers, give them a call. Write a polite email to say, fix it. If you don't do that, the case manager will see to it. A judge will say, hey, listen, the, this, this pleadings need an amendment. Uh, how much time do you need? Okay, three days, fix it in three days, file your amendment. Um, there's a document that is required. Um, have you got it? Yes, well, give us a copy now, hand it to your opponent. No more technical strategic points because these things uh, trigger interlocutory applications and that's just a waste of time and costs. And now we get to pleadings. In the next module, I will give, I will give you more practical instruction on how to draft particulars of claim. But what I want to tell you now is that particulars of claim and a plea is not supposed to be a technical precedent-based document. Particulars of claim, claim must be set out, must set out the peculiar facts of your client's case, the relevant conclusions of law and the remedy sought. I will explain that to you in more detail in a minute. The plea must be a detailed response to the particulars of claim and make clear the actual issues between the parties. What we see now are bare denials, strategic vagueness, and so on. I mean, the allegations herein are, are denied as if specifically traversed and plaintiff is put to the proof thereof. What does that mean? Okay, it's absolutely meaningless. The rules tell you what to do in a plea, but we ignore those rules. Instead, we have this, this strategic vagueness that is there. So when the judge reads the papers, judge doesn't know what the issue is. Well, that has stopped. And as I told you, in many countries, they've scrapped these technical pleadings that we have. I mean, you've all seen uh, pleadings in accident cases, all the accidents happen in exactly the same way. It comes from the same precedent. Your client tells you that the driver, the other driver went through a red robot. What, how, what do you draft? He failed to keep a proper lookout. Now the judge doesn't know what that means, but this is how we carry on. The case manager during the proceeding either Meromotu or in the application of one of the parties, dispose of individual issues in the matter. Or they can even dispose of the whole case if there's no prospect of success. This business of litigating to buy time is out. You, you, you must be familiar with the new amendment to the to summary judgment. I thought it's a brilliant amendment. I, I couldn't understand why we didn't do it 20 years ago. Go and have a look. You'll see what's behind that amendment. Time scales have to be shorter and more certain. All cases must progress to trial in accordance with a timetable. That never happened here. You know, if client, if client walked in 
first consultation and says, uh, uh, Mr. Smith, how long will this take? Mr. Smith will probably look up into the ceiling, emit a low whistle and say, well, how long is a piece of string? We don't know, it depends on this, it depends on that. The last thing he tells client is that, well, you know, I'm not gonna try and resolve this thing tomorrow, okay? It's gonna run, maybe years, okay? That's what's gonna happen. Well, stop it. The case manager will apply compliance now with the uniform rules and san strict sanctions will be applied to parties and their attorneys who don't comply. Mm -hmm. uh, the case manager determine, determines the length of the trial. And what is to happen at the hearing? You know, you've all been to, um, you've been to this, to, to pretrial conferences where you have to estimate how long will the trial take? I mean, this is a circus. Uh, the, the one attorney says, uh, how long do you think this trial will run? Well, the other attorney says, well, how many witnesses do you have? This attorney says, well, I've got five witnesses actually doesn't have a clue. He doesn't even know who the witnesses are. But he says, I've got five. The other attorney, well, he's not going to be outdone. He says, well, I've got four witnesses. Oh, well, nine witnesses. We need at least four to five days. They haven't even seen a single witness yet. You know, this is abuse. So what we want, and here's the statement, the cost of litigation will be more affordable, more predictable, more proportionate to the value and to the value and complexity of the case. So you don't have disproportionate litigation taking place over long periods of time. Now this needs to be mentioned, costs, because this is very close to our hearts, right? I mean, it's always about the costs. Well, if you go and look at the, those of you who read law reports, the, there are a number of judgments where costs are no longer a simple case of the winner takes all, or that the that costs follow the result. You know the usual order. Courts will now consider other factors. For example, the plaintiff wins. The judge will say, "But you know what? This these summons were issued in 2014. Why did this happen?" And I'm, the judge will now take that into account in awarding costs. Uh, costs may be disallowed for certain procedures that were unnecessary. For example, there was an enormous amount of documents that were discovered um, unnecessarily. The, the judge will say, right, those, those costs are disallowed. If a winner, if the winner is found to have litigated on an extravagant sale, out of a scale, out of proportion to the value and complexity of the matter, costs will be disallowed. Courts will deal with cases in ways proportionate to the amount involved, the importance of the matter or the complex complexity of the issues, and also the party's financial position. So these are factors that we never really addressed. When, when dealing with an order for costs at the end of the case. Um, in our pleadings, we, we always say um, costs of suit, okay? Well, now it might look different. You'll have a heading in your particulars of claim uh, that say costs and say these, the parties had tried to settle the matter. There's a chronology. There's been unreasonable conduct Okay, then you say punitive cost order. Taxing bills of costs is going to change completely. Our taxing masters haven't been up, are not up to speed. We know that, but give them time, and they will come, come, uh, come to grips with the with the new method. Um, as I told you, in the UK and in Canada case managers will set a budget. How much are we gonna spend on this? Um, how an attorney conducts litigation and how he behaves is often dictated by costs 
that is a factor we take into account. If we run this, we can run up costs. We bring um, lots of interlocutories. We can build a client for that. Well, the new case management regime put an end to it. Oh, by the way, we saw that once case management comes in, the unopposed motion role just shrank. It almost disappeared. Okay. Now, one of the things we want the practitioners to do is establish the substance of the dispute between the parties at an early stage. When I say early stage, I mean before you issue summons or even at a point when pleadings close at that stage. If you don't do it, when, when active judicial management comes in, as it has, as they are doing in the UK and in Canada and Australia, once pleadings close, you'll be called to a case, to a case manager who will say, okay, pleadings have closed. Let's see what the dispute is. And let's see if we can't solve as many of them as we can. You know, you could actually finish a matter in two months. That's how effective it is. Parties and their attorneys will have to identi identify issues at an early stage so that they may, many of them can be agreed or decided before going to court. Now, this is happening already. In this province, when you go to trial, the pleadings is not what the judge is looking for. The judge is looking for the minutes of the pretrial conference. In those minutes, you are now supposed to write down what you and your opponent have decided is the issue for trial. And you have to write it down. You can't say refer to the pleadings because then you won't know. Judges have found out this business of referring to pleadings is a waste of time. You have to write it down yourself in your own words, what is the issue? Um, where, where attorneys have difficulty in reaching agreement, let's say it's a, it's a technical matter over discovery or over the plea. Um, these are issues which a case manager can resolve. If, if the opposing practitioners can't re resolve it themselves, there's always the case manager, okay? Um, so you and your client will risk, risk adverse cost orders if you conduct litigation in an oppressive manner. You have to be less adversarial and more cooperative. That's the message, okay? If, if you are one of those adversarial lawyers, and there are many of them, I used to be one myself, well, start rehabilitating yourself and your practice. Otherwise, you will not survive. The objective is to enable the court to deal with cases justly, and there is an express duty on the parties to help the court to further it. That's Lord Wolf speaking. So, you know, I'm reminded of, of what happens in court now. You know, when you come to court, and you put a version to a witness that is absolute nonsense. The judge looks at you and says, Mr. Smith, do you expect me to believe that version? Really? What is Mr. Smith's response? Well, my Lord, those were my instructions. And we got away with it. Now a judge will say, Mr. Smith, those were your instructions. Are you not an officer of this court? Don't you know that you shouldn't come with a version like that? So the ball is back in your court. You can't hide behind that. So as an attorney, you must be aware of the options available to your client in order to resolve the dispute. And look at time and costs. Be ready to discuss these options with client. That's important. Clients don't know this, okay? What clients know is that you have to issue a summons. That's, that's what uh, they've been uh, conditioned to understand. That's what we do as lawyers. We issue a summons, okay? And, and we are there to fight their cases. Yeah, you've heard people say, even the lawyers will say, we fight a case, vigorous opposition. Well, that has to stop. 
look at the non-adversarial options first. That's exactly what Rule 41A tells you. Uh, now, I want to, I'm getting close to finishing this session. This is, to me is very important for two reasons. It trains you to apply your mind, number one, and number two, it also helps you to, to deal with your legal problems more efficiently and cost effectively and make your client happy. That's what you want. Now, here's a quotation, no matter how complex a problem, you can bet there will be a simple solution. There's always a simple solution. Who makes it complex? We do. We make it complex. So let's go through this step by step. How does a lawyer approach this thing? I'm going to summarize it first. Obtain and absorb all the relevant facts. That's number one. Now, for, for God's sake, if you are in dispute resolution, this is where you start. Get all the facts first. Review all the documents first. Talk to the witnesses first. Don't do all of those things when you've got a trial date, okay? It's too late. Work out what the issue is. What is the question that arises from, from the facts? Remember, a legal issue or a legal problem only arises from some event or transaction your client was involved in. It's not something that magically appears um, out of nowhere. It is connected directly to the facts of the case. The third step is for you, once you have done that, you've got the facts, you recognize the issue, now contextualize it. So find out what area of law does this, um, does this entail? Is it contract? Is it delict? Um, is it defamation? Um, what area of the law? Medical negligence, uh, unlawful arrest. <laughs> Those are the two most popular things that happen in Joburg, apart from RAF. Um, what, what area of the law? In other words, as a lawyer, you're going to ask, I've seen the issue. I know what the dispute is. Now I want to see the, the issue is governed by a rule of law, by a rule. I want to see what that rule is. The fourth step, find the applicable law while being focused on the facts of your case. Now, here's a big mistake that happens. Never run off to look at the law if you don't know the facts, because the law can't help you if you don't know the facts. And also, if you don't know the facts, you will be misdirected when you go and research the law. Because in step five, you will have to apply the law to the facts of your case. Do your facts satisfy the rule? The then you look for the answer. Now, how do you look for the answer? You have to reach a conclusion from a set of facts and the law. So you cannot start litigation if you don't know where you're going. It's what we call a case concept. You must know the, the, the evidence available to you. You must know what the law is and can you satisfy the requirements based on the evidence available and then look at the relief you can get. It is a logical sequence, okay? It's a it's six step uh, logic. What you want is to comply with those steps in that order. Now, I must, I must just tell you, those of you who are interested, the practicing law is about the application of logic. It's not about the application of precedence. That's the mistake you make. It's about applying your own mind. Then you're being a lawyer. I mean, any idiot can copy and paste, OK? And therefore, you find people who copy and paste from the wrong precedent even. I've seen it over the years, all right? Both in pleadings 
And also in commercial documents, I've seen the wrong precedents being used. So the fault is that you don't apply your own mind. Uh, let me tell you, you are intelligent people. You've got degrees. You've got the capacity. Back yourselves. Apply the logic. It makes, it makes for enriching practical experience. You enjoy law when you do that. Okay. So the first step, obtaining the facts. Something happened. You need to obtain the, doc the, the facts from your client. You must imp that includes uh, the documents. Now, before you analyze the facts, you need to do the following. Retain only the relevant facts. Facts that will assist you to resolve the issue. That's very important because clients don't know what's relevant. You have to help them. The problem with irrelevance is that it adds time, it adds unnecessary complexity, and it, it, it makes the matter more costly. Now, the second part, we said the facts must be relevant to the issue. Now, look at the second test is for me one of the most important tests and lawyers fail to do this all the time and it bites them in court. Test the facts. Are these facts firstly capable of being proved in court? In other words, do you have credible evidence? Is no use saying, oh, you know, I've got a case. But if your opponent disputes the case, you'll then have to prove it in court. Do you have the evidence? There's no point in starting litigation if you don't have the evidence. The third test, is the version likely to have happened? <laughs> Lawyers don't do this. <laughs> this is the, the old story of those were my instructions. Please, if your client gives you what we call a BS version, then don't accept it as those are my instructions. Tell your client that's improbable. A judge is not going to believe it. We are going to run up costs and you're going to lose, okay? Because you cannot win a case on a version that was not likely to have happened. That is what is meant by proof on a balance of probabilities. If your version is not probable, don't go to court. Here's how you do this. You have to write down the material facts of your client's version. It's very important for you to write this down. Always write the version down in a sequence, chronological sequence. Because logic dictates that if your client's version does not make sense sequentially, then there's something wrong. It's, more, it's, it's, it's likely to be improbable. Okay. Make a note of your client's version of the disputed facts. Now, test that as well. Is your client's version probable? If the answer is yes, then proceed. And then very importantly, and this is something lawyers, again, don't take seriously. Make a note of the undisputed facts between the parties or those facts that you know the other side are not likely to be able to dispute. Very important to do that. When we come to motion court, I'll tell you why. Ask if your client's version is supported by the undisputed facts. Now, this is the logic. This is lawyer's logic. If your client has a version, tells you this is what happened. Now take the unopposed, undisputed facts and say, do those undisputed facts support my client's version? If they don't, you've got a problem. It's a brilliant test. It works every time. Now, this is what is meant by thinking like a lawyer. You are not to proceed with the matter merely by accepting a narrative from your client on the basis that those are my instructions. Uh, that takes you nowhere. Uh, your client's going to lose. If the version is improbable, well, just stop right there, okay? Analyze the facts first. Call for instructions. Um, if there are gaps, call for instructions. Having obtained all the facts, 
Now ask, what are the issues? Now, there are two sets of issues you have to identify. The one is issues of fact, where there's a dispute of fact. Plaintiff says, defendant signed the surety ship. Defendant says, that's not my signature. It's a dispute of fact that needs to be resolved. Then there are legal issues, disputes of law. And there may be more than one factual or legal issue. You must identify each of them. Now, take it from me. You cannot do this if you don't know all the facts. You know, it's like trying to find something in a dark room. You are going to be misdirected. Where more than one issue emerges, rank them according to importance. Key to, to this is to understand exactly how each issue arose from the facts as you have obtained them. That's the trick, okay. Another test, how, do, how does the client understand the issues? Now, this is important. Your understanding of the issue must be the same as your client's. Your client mustn't understand differently. Clients are not lawyers. Sometimes they come and say, well, this is my problem. But in fact, you will identify it as a different problem. Explain it to them um, and, and get, get an, a common understanding. If you get this wrong, there'll be misdirection again. Now, the third step, by now you know that the facts, the facts that you work out that uh, you used facts to work out the legal and factual issues. Now find the law. Now begin by establishing the area of law applicable. This is what we call contextualize the law. Now it is the facts and the issues that will tell you what law to look at. Your job is to correctly identify and understand the law. Then you have to explain the law before you can apply the facts to your case. So you have to understand the law as well. Understand the basic principles. What are the requirements of the rule? And can you, can you comply with the facts of your case? Now, you have to look at applicable legislation in, in many cases. But as lawyers, as practicing lawyers, the best source of the law is in the law reports. And what you do, and this is the thinking, for every instance of legal reasoning that you engage in, you must be able to cross-reference to the law or other legal authority. So you've got the facts, you identified the issue. Now, Cross-reference that to a case um, or, or legislation. You only rely on textbooks to give you the basic principles, um, but you cannot rely on the textbook as your authority. With a common law jurisdiction, the law is what the court says the law. Don't forget that. Now, a useful technique, once you've read a case or you read a series of cases and you under, think you understand the law, most of us, when we read a judgment, will say, ah, oh, I know what, I understand this case. Try something, close the law report. Now write, try and write a short chapter on what you think the ratio is or what you think are the requirements of the law in terms of that case. You'll be surprised. If you are able to write that down, it means you understood it. Brilliant. Many lawyers will sit there and scratch their heads and say, well, what do I write? Or they struggle to write. It means that you're kidding yourself. You didn't understand the law. Go back and read it. So be honest with yourself. Uh, this is a very difficult step, 
step five, applying the law to your facts. This is where you weave the law and the facts to come to a conclusion. As a lawyer, a fact, issue, law, answer, conclusion. That's the logical reasoning, okay? At university, you, you learned the legal rules of the law. And you learned that the law can be broken up into its components. It's what we call the elements of the law um, or the elements of the rule. Legal rules have distinct requirements or elements. And for you to succeed in court, you must be able to provide the evidence that proves those, um, those distinct requirements based on your client's version of the facts. You must first state the rule in general terms before you look at the specific elements, okay? Now, the strength of your case will depend on how well you can make out or prove each element of the rule. Very often, you'll be able to prove one, but not the other. You've got a problem, okay? Um, you, must, you must come to a conclusion. Now, I know it's difficult with litigation because there are certain things you can't predict, like the performance of a witness. But before you start the litigation, you must be aware of all of this. Now, those of you who are actually very keen and interested in this kind of thing, um, you know, uh, we're, we're a bit behind uh, the, the times here. If you look at the universities in, 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 in England and in Canada, in the US, in Europe, um, Australia even, they are offering law students a course on logical thinking. Now, I've looked at those courses. They are absolutely brilliant. And there are a number of books written about it that you can go and look. And what it does, it teaches you as a law student how to function or reason like a lawyer. And look, we're all not born to this thing. In fact, nobody's born to this thing. You have to teach yourself. But you teach yourself Firstly, by knowing the technique, but most importantly, by applying the technique. If you, if you are going to be one of those lawyers that gets um, vague instructions from client, holds out Ambler, bangs out a summons, issues it, and tells client he'll get the summons by Friday, okay? Client thinks you're a brilliant lawyer. All you did is you are being a uselessly vigorous lawyer. That's what you have been. That's not a good lawyer, okay? Um, so I conclude by saying, your conclusion must be supported by the facts and must be supported by the legal rule. And the best, best place to find the legal rule is the most recent decision of the highest court, okay? Don't start with 1947 AD. Okay, look, start now, 2021 Constitutional Court. If you can find a judgment like that, it's all you need. You don't, in the past, and this comes from our academic training, for every legal rule, we will have 20 cases for practice. You, you don't want that. The judges don't want to read 20 cases. They want to read the most recent decision of the highest court that's applicable. One, that, one judgment is all you want, okay. Now, we spent an hour with a lot of this stuff, all the stuff that I've been explaining to you. And guess what? You have not issued summons yet. Now you realize how much goes into being, goes into, into, um, dispute resolution. If you're not prepared to do that, if you're not prepared to apply your mind, you're in the wrong profession. Okay. Well, I'm going to stop now. I, do, I don't know, Samantha, if there's time for questions. Uh, I had to make up the time from the 
the technical glitches we had. Um, no, that's uh, fine. Uh, we're going to run on for 10 minutes at the Pakistan. I'm hoping that our delegates stay on. Um, we have 10 minutes, so we're going to jump right through it. Um, I would like to draw everybody's attention to the poll that's going to be on the screen very soon. Please, can you take a few seconds to complete this? as it's very important for us and helpful to create and deliver uh, relevant content for you. Uh, at the same, thank you very much. I'm sure the attendees found it helpful. We're going to jump right into the Q&A. I hope you're ready. There are some very interesting questions. OK, uh, the first one is, what is the reason and possible recourse when an attorney removes a case from the role without informing the clients? and removal is given a green light by the applicant or plaintiff as the master of the case? Yeah, uh, look, the, 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 what you're putting your finger on is the real problem. Very often, things like removing from the role, setting down interlocutories, agreeing to postponements, all of that happens without instructions from clients. Firstly, that is ethically wrong. You must talk to client. By the way, whenever lawyers say, those are my instructions, in fact, they write letters, every letter starts with our instructions are, half the time client doesn't even know they're doing it. Client hasn't given them instructions. So it's ethically wrong. And the client can actually complain about it. They can complain to the, uh, to the uh, LPC about it, but they could raise it in front of a, a case manager or a judge and the, and the attorney may end up paying costs. So there is a recourse. The, the reason we get away with it is because clients don't know. <laughs> okay, um, another question is sometimes parties are ready for cases to go to trial, but courts have such a backlog that a trial date can only be obtained up to two years from the date of application or the matter is constantly referred back by a registrar due to minor technical details. Mm. Are there met methods for registrars and courts to speed up the process? I told you before, and I'll say it again, the delay is not caused by the registrars, nor is it caused by the system, nor are there impossible technical requirements to comply with. The delay, the, the backlog itself, and there is a backlog. The backlog is caused by, an, by, by the system, which allows attorneys to do as they please, take their own time, don't uh, meet with each other, don't resolve disputes and so on. We, we know that when the attorneys are, and, and, and well, the practitioners are managed correctly, matters can be finished in this country. And I'm talking of how, Gauteng, we managed to finish matters within a year. And the judge president in this province is, is saying, we can bring that down to nine months. But it cannot happen without the cooperation of the profession. It's in the hands of the lawyers. It's not in the hands of the registrar and, and the registrar's requirements and so on. Those things are easy to comply with, OK? OK. I there's just been a very um, common request here, I could have said, for the name of the book on logical thinking. Uh, perhaps we uh, can do that uh, in our response. Well, the, the one book where, that you should look at where, where, where I deal with it within a South African context is the book on practical legal drafting. Uh, that's my book, this one, OK, um, designed by Samantha. Uh, the cover that is, um, um, this has a section on it. But what I can do is uh, there's a, there's a, th this is also a Lexis book, Lexis Nexus publication. So I can, so I can say it, yeah. <laughs> Lawyering and Positive Professional Identities. It's an Australian book, deals with it. It's a brilliant book. Um, it's called Lawyering and Positive Professional Identities. It's published by LexisNexis. 
written by Rachel Field, James Duffy, and Anna Huggins. Um, I'm just trying to see which version. Um, yeah, 2014. I bought I, I bought these books um, in in Australia. Um, but you can order it from Lexus Nexus. I suppose they'll get it for you. Um, that's that's the um, that's one of the books. There are there are a few others. Um, but when I get to the third um, webinar, I'll try and put together a list of books for you that you can that will help you to uh, to read. And I always say this. If you're not reading a book a month, you're going to be a bum lawyer. Simple as that. Okay. Um, Afghanistan, I think this one is in response to the discussion on mediation, I suppose. Uh, mm -hmm. The statement is, or the question is, must we become problem solvers and not litigators? Yes. Simple answer, yes. There's a case. Go and read it. It's in the, the references. Uh, it was on the screen. It's, uh, it was called Brownlee versus Brownlee, but we're not allowed to use that citation anymore because it involved uh, minor children. Now that is worth reading. I'll tell you what happened there. You can tell by the citation that it's a divorce. The, it was an acrimonious divorce, you know, the war of the roses type thing. And the matter got to court and the judge was an experienced silk looked at this file and he realized that the culprits here were not the couple. They didn't create all these disputes. The lawyers did it. And he called the lawyers to court and he said, listen, explain all of these things. He then discovered that the lawyers had a, an entirely adversarial approach, were not solving problems. They were not assisting the parties to resolve issues. Guess what happened? The judge made the lawyers pay all the costs. It's a reported decision. Go ahead and read it. Um, another question out of the same is, and, and following that, are there any other cases where punitive costs were awarded for failure to settle or door settlements besides Brownlee case? Yeah, no, yes, there are. Um, there are a couple of cases here in um, the Gauteng Local Division. There's a judgment by Sa Judge Satchwell, um, um, Malachi's case. Although that, one, that case was set aside in the SCA, but it was set aside on a technicality. The principles that she came up with about the conduct of lawyers, advocates, attorneys, and experts still holds. So go and read that case. It's, I think it's called Malachi versus the uh, the, uh, the the road accidents fund. Okay. Um, there's a question here. In the UK, proportionality is the overriding objective in terms of discovery. Correct. Do you becoming the case here in South Africa? Yes, it is. Certainly. Um, our book on e-discovery discusses this. Um, but this business of uh, discovering everything um, has to stop. You see, the, the problem lies in the fact that the practitioners have not identified the issues for trial. And then they want to discover documents. So what do, you do? what do they do? They discover everything. I mean, when I was an attorney, I was in a big firm. I didn't even draw the schedules to the discovery affidavit. That was done by a paralegal. And it's still like that today. So guess what? The one person who knows absolutely nothing about the case is drafting the schedules to the discovery affidavit. I mean, it's just nonsense. Yeah. Um, I don't think we have much more time, Advocate. So I'm just yeah. going to put this one question here. Has Rule 41A helped mediate matters? It seems that practitioners simply bypass it by opposing mediation and stating the matter is incapable of mediation in the same way that they bypass settlement discuss, uh, discussion in pretrial conferences? Look, you can always bypass this, but you are going to end up in court then. Firstly, if you decide to bypass any ADR methods, 
it's usually done by a litigant who does not want to engage in that kind of uh, mediation or negotiation and so on. Why? Because they're not focused on resolving any disputes. They are litigation, litigating, not because they have a genuine dispute, but for other reasons. That's an abuse of process. That will come out in court. This Brownlee case I was telling you about, that's exactly what happened. The attorneys bypassed everything. They refused to cooperate and just ran the matter. They ended up paying the costs. Don't risk doing that. Okay, I'm sorry, but that's all the time we okay. have. Uh, Thank you, Africa the same for sharing your insights and expertise with us and being very entertaining as well. Thank you all of us for joining. Remember that this is a three-part webinar series running from August to October. To derive maximum benefit, you should have attended or at least viewed the prior webinars in this series before moving on to the next. Um, remember that the webinar recording will be made available to you in a few days. You can then look out for the next sessions, session two in September, which will look at unopposed and opposed motion procedure, and session three in October, which will look at trial preparation and trial strategy. We trust that you found our session useful and look forward to connecting with you again soon. Just um, one, one point, yeah. sorry, before I go, Samantha. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, you're right, the, 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 the next two, the next two, um, must be, uh, will, will be very useful, where I'll actually take you to various procedures. One of the things I'm going to deal with in the second one is a, attorney's bread and butter. It's bringing urgent applications. Attorneys get, and, and advocates get this wrong all the time. I'll tell you how to do that, okay? So I'm going to leave you by saying, make sure you Tune in to the next exciting episode. Fantastic. Thank you, Advocate Sam. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Goodbye. Right. Bye. Bye.